Gianmaria Gabbianelli, uh, postdoctoral researcher at the University School for Advanced Study, U IUSS Pavia. And yes, this, uh, this uh, lecture is focused on the challenges and developments in sea uh, storage pilot rocks assessment. In particular, we will deal mainly on um, uh, the most recent uh, uh, outcomes uh, um, uh, highlighted in the rec in recent uh, papers and publications, but also we try to highlight all the needs and the further research uh, necessary for um, better estimate and assess the behavior on both in static and seismic design of the rocks. And maybe also not only the, the seismic design, but also related to the robustness of the, uh, of the rocks, because it is also another important um, uh, topic that uh, need to be uh, better um, uh, studied, of course. Okay, so first of all, I would like to uh, spend some, some minutes here on uh, what are the sea storage pallet rocks. Uh, well, there are, of course, you have already seen a lot in, uh, in logistic areas, logistic industries, and uh, uh, and so on. But they are uh, they have a peculiar some peculiarities that. Um, they lead to a different behavior with respect to the common and traditional steel structures. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are several uh, dedicated standards uh, related to the racks and to design worldwide, both in European uh, context, but also in the US, Australia, China, and so on. There are um, dedicated standards. Well, the racks are uh, very briefly, uh, steel structures, and they are used for the uh, storing the goods and uh, merchandise of any kind of any type. Um, and um, we can um, find two different typologies of you know, frame uh, if we consider the down aisle or the longitudinal direction and the trans cross aisle or transversal direction. Uh, Indeed, in the transversal direction, we have a bracing system uh, which provides the lateral stiffness and the resistance due for the horizontal forces. Uh, the bracing system is uh, um, combined, used, uh, adopted with a, a diagonal bracing uh, elements, um, while uh, we have in the longitudinal direction a uh, moment resisting frame. In this case, instead, the stability is provided mainly by the uh, base plate connections and the beam to column connections. So all the, uh, the stiffness and the resistance and the plasticity is concentrated in these two particular connections. We have also a uh, pallet beam, which is actually the, um, the member that link uh, together all the cross aisle frames and is commonly um, use a, um, commonly we use hollow uh, uh, rectangular shaped sections. Uh, instead, for the uprights, we have um, commonly in C shaped section with a very very small thickness, and um, this is uh, mainly the peculiarity behind the um, the use of the C storage pilot rocks. As a matter of fact, here you can see the, the most common um, shape for the, for the sections of the upright. And uh, as you can see, are open. They, are, they have a very small thickness. We can talk about 1.5 millimeters to um, 3.5 millimeters at most. And there are also holes all along the, uh, the upright. And these, these characteristics uh, lead us to uh, switch from uh, the uh, from uh, the uh, most common and uh, known Euler Bernoulli beam column element to uh, we have to adopt instead of the Blazov theory. So we have to modify the beam column in order to uh, take into account these new features. Um, the most important one is actually the, uh, the centricity between the centroid of the section and the shear center. 
this is very important because uh, this and this feature together with the fact that the thickness of the section is very small um, lead to uh, the introduction of a new displacement of a new degree of freedom if we talk about uh, if we think about a, a finite element framework uh, this new displacement is the warping and together with the warping we have a new internal stress internal force which is the b moment oh, and of course from this internal force we have additional stresses uh, both in the uh, longitudinal direction of the element but also in the transversal direction so we have longitudinal stresses and the trans uh, tangential stresses and of course uh, uh, um, as a consequence we have also new strains new set of strains but uh, we are talking about the warping but when we have this, this new displacement, this new um, um, feature, let's say. Well, here there is a plot where in the horizontal axis, we have the a K, which stands for the characteristic dimensional length. And in the vertical axis, we have instead um, another dimensional value, which represents uh, how much we can have uh, the warping effects, or, or in this case, the B moment in a um, in an element. Okay. The key, the is and so the characteristic at dimensional length is uh, somehow um, a representation of the ratio between the stiffness of the uh, torsion of the element or of the section and the stiffness uh, for the warping. So we have actually in the square root, we have the shear modulus G times uh, IT, which is the torsional inertia. Uh, then we have uh, E, which is the elastic modulus times the uh, IW, which is the warping constant. So this ratio uh, can help us on how uh, to understand if our building, or in this case, our element, it can be subject to a warping. Uh, we can see the plot. We have in a function of key, um, different um, shape of the section. We have uh, here, for instance, a C shape of section when we have a K value from zero to two. Uh, from two to five, we have uh, the double uh, I uh, section. And from 5 to 20, we have a hollow over rectangular section. And finally, from 20 to 100, we have um, rectangular sections. Okay, so we can see that if we start from the uh, from zero to one to two, we have a very important, a very significant effect of the warping. If instead we take a look at the end, we where we have commonly the reinforced concrete sections. We instead have only uniform torsion, and therefore we have uh, we do not have the warping effect. But how, from a finite element point of view, uh, we can consider the, the warping? Well, we have to add a new degree of freedom, which is the seventh one, and therefore we have to modify the matrix for the stiffness. In particular, here you can see the upper left quarter of the, of the matrix of our bin column. So our element, which commonly is uh, 12 by 12, but in this case, uh, it will be 14 uh, by 14. So we have to add in, the, in this quarter, a new, uh, an additional row and an additional column. But we have also to modify the stiffness in, in the torsional um, for the, in the torsional contribution. Okay, we have also the, uh, the addition of the warping constant and the elastic modulus. At the same with the same uh, approach, we have to modify the uh, geometrical stiffness matrix. This matrix is instead. Um, used for, uh, for nonlinear analysis when we want to uh, take into account the second order effects. So the P delta effects. So the nonlinearity is due to the geometric uh, effect. Here, again, the upper left quarter matrix, and I did not um, plot, um, denoted all 
of the contribution of all the values because they will be very uh, large uh, metrics. But I just reported the fact that in these metrics, we have not only the axial load, uh, so the internal force uh, for the axial load, but we have to use also the bending moments and the B moment. This is very important because, for instance, if you perform a backlink analysis in a common finite element software, and you have a cantilever, for instance, and you apply a bending moment, uh, you will not have any eigenvalue because the metrics, so the geometrical metrics, uh, is constructed only with the axial load. So you will have a result only if you applied a compression. But if you use instead a software with seven degree of freedom formulation, you can uh, use the, take this cantilever, apply a bending moment, and you will find actually a value, which is the critical moment. And for the practitioner, it will be very useful because if you take a look, for instance, at the Euro code and to, to the formulation used for the computation of the critical moment in, uh, in beams and columns in steel structures, you will see that the equation is very, very uh, complicated. It's not straightforward to use. And it is also limited to um, some particular boundary and load condition. But in this case, with a seven degree of freedom per node uh, formulation, you can uh, use any kind of load, any kind of boundary conditions, and you will be also always uh, able to, to compute the critical mode. Now, uh, during my PhD, uh, together with my research group, we developed a new finite element software because at that time there wasn't any uh, in commercial software. There was no uh, software able to predict the warping. Uh, therefore, we developed one. And we've uh, started to uh, perform uh, several numerical analysis uh, with uh, some parametric analysis, modifying and designing uh, racks with different uh, stiffness of the connections, different uh, height, uh, different uh, length, uh, and so on. Loads, we, we change a lot of parameters. And we would aim to understand how much from a design point of view, the warping will change the outcomes. So in this case, we, we can see that we plotted the uh, safety index, which is uh, actually this, this equation that you can see here below, um, which says that uh, in the plot, we have the ratio between the safety index computed with seven DOF formulation and the safety index computed with a six DOF formulation. Uh, you can see that we always have a safety index ratio higher than the unity, higher than one. Therefore, it means that if we adopt a seven dot formulation, we will have um, uh, the internal forces higher than the one with the six dot. So it means very simply that if we, we perform the analysis with a six dot formulation, we will not be conservative. We will not, we may have some problems after the design because we are not considering additional forces acting on, this, on the rack. We did also similar things related to the uh, computation of the critical load multiplier, but also on the computation of the first fundamental period of vibration. And very briefly here, you can see that uh, for the critical load multiplier, we will always have a ratio between the two um, higher than one. This means that if we perform the backing analysis with a six, uh, DOF formulation, we will have a higher critical load multiplier, which again is uh, go um, uh, from a, in an uh, unconservative uh, mm, direction. Um, also, here, if you can see instead in the green uh, curve, in the green area where we have the plot of a T racks, which stands for a rack with a um, hollow square section for the uprights, we will have again an increase of the critical load multiplier with six stop formulation. But at least the variability is not so much. We are not increasing uh, so much the, the value. Instead, if we use an open cross section, such as for the G and M racks, 
we will have actually a very, very important uh, um, increase. Same things applies actually uh, in the period where we have with a seven off formulation, a larger period, which again, in this case, it means that we have always value lower than the unit. This means uh, putting all together all this uh, information that the, the rack with the seven dot formulation, so with the warping effect, will be more flexible. This means that it will be uh, more near to the uh, critical load and it will have a period uh, larger. And this is important to know. Then we have also the chance to uh, compare the numerical analysis with ex some experimental tests. We have the chance to be guest in a European project, which is SizeRack2, where they tested four different uh, racks. Uh, full, uh, they perform pushover full scale tests. And the important thing is to uh, consider one moment the sections that were adopted in the in the experimental test because we have the, the section, the first section, which is the IPA, which has a, a quite different uh, shape if compared to all the three others. Uh, indeed, we have the ratio between the two inertia higher than the other. We have kind of five while all the other uh, kind of two. Also, the centricity is uh, between the shear center and the centroid is lower. And all these considerations lead to the fact that the K parameter, the characteristic dimensional length, is higher for this section. And therefore, we, are, we expect that for this section, the warping effect will be lower if compared to the other. As a matter of fact, if we first perform some backing analysis, we will obtain uh, an increase of the critical load multiplier with six off uh, from 30% to 50% in the three latter uh, racks. But for the first one, the increase is only of the 13%. Same thing applies to the model analysis where we com compare also the, the period, the first fundamental period of vibration. And again, we, have, we can see that the, for the first one, we have an increase only of the 8%, while for the others, we range between 20 and 33%, which is a, very, uh, is a significant difference. Then finally, we have, can compare the numerical, the numerical curve, but with the experimental one. What we was expecting was that for the first rack, the difference between the two formulations uh, was not uh, so important. And actually, it is what we found out. So the difference between the two is, is very, uh, they are actually very close. But the important thing is that the experimental test is very, very similar to the one, uh, to the uh, numerical curve with seven degree of freedom and formulation. Same thing applies to the second and the third uh, rack, where we have again uh, more agreement with uh, from with the experimental curve and the uh, seven dot formulation. We just only have some uh, problems in the last uh, in the last uh, test because actually in this in this rack and there were some nonlinearities not in the connections but in the uprights. And at that time, the, the software wasn't able, wasn't, uh, was concentrating the, the plasticity, the, non, the material nonlinearities only on the connections. But we are working hard in these years in order to uh, improve uh, the software and uh, permit us to uh, uh, put the uh, plasticity also on the, on the uprights. Then we focus only also on the um, on existing racks where maybe in you will not have the um, all of the informations uh, on the connections but also on the upright moment resistance so we are dealing with epistemic uncertainties uh, what we've done here is to create a logic tree where we 
uh, define different values that can be assigned to the connections and to the uprights. And we assign to the most probable uh, values a weight, an higher weight than the others. And then we uh, made a different combinations and we perform nonlinear dynamic analysis and we construct, we develop uh, fragility functions. In this case, we consider the, the drift, but also for in the first uh, in the left picture, but also the uh, rotation of the beam to column connections and the rotation of the base plate. And here you can see all of the fragility functions with all of the configuration that we used. And you can see that the variability can be uh, not so large, but uh, we have some, some differences actually. Um, this is the case for the unbraced rack, but we performed also the same uh, analysis to braced rack, to a braced rack, where we uh, um, apply a bracing system in the long longitudinal direction. And what we have discovered is that actually in this case, the, the variability is very, uh, is very low. We, the, the influence, the change in the parameters of the connections and the upright resistance in a braced uh, rack uh, will not lead to uh, a huge dispersion of the outcome. So this maybe can be expected, but uh, we wanted to uh, um, identify the, the numbers, the real numbers. Uh, we performed in the, in the last years, and so this is a paper which is uh, under review. We wanted to um, make available the direct displacement based design also for C-storage pallet racks. Uh, what the direct displacement based design uh, background is, is that we want to, uh, instead of um, take, a, take a building, uh, compute the period, uh, compute the, for the seismic actions, then uh, verify the internal forces and verify the displacement. We want to, to work uh, exactly the opposite. We, we start with, with a, a target displacement. So we want that, that building for that seismic actions have to um, move with this target displacement. From this one, we can identify the ductility that we need to reach that displacement. And back from the, uh, from the ductility, we can therefore estimate the, the equivalent period, the equivalent stiffness, and therefore the, the actions. So the base shear that acts into the, in the building. What was missing uh, so far was the, the function that correlate the equivalent viscous damping ratio to the ductility, because this function is very is a, uh, uh, dedicated only for uh, some particular buildings, such as the steel uh, steel building, the real steel building, uh, the reinforced concrete buildings. But uh, there was missing information uh, for for racks. Therefore, we computed a lot of. Uh, uh, numerical analysis uh, calibrated with experimental tests, and we therefore uh, define a new uh, new function that you can see here in the picture on the right, which uh, link the the equivalent viscous damping ratio to the ductility for C storage pilot rocks, both for the transversal and the longitudinal direction. There is also um, another uh, important topic to deal with. In, uh, with the side with the with the racks, which is uh, the forklift impact and the collapse, because uh, there are two threats that can be found for the racks. The first one is the seismic uh, action, so the earthquake. But the other one, the other uh, reason why the racks collapse is the forklift impact. As you can see in the in the video, and there sometimes there is just a little hit that can. Uh, may collapse um, in the racks. And if they are in a logistic areas, there are a lot of racks uh, close to each other and then can be uh, can um, provide a domino effects. And uh, you can have a very a huge disaster here. So what we can do here for um, to, uh, to simulate see this aspect. 
uh, we can use the applied element method, which is a, a new uh, approach, quite new approach, which uh, take the advantage of the finite element method and the discrete element method and permit us to uh, perform analysis both in the pre and the post failure scenarios. Uh, the first uh, study on this topic was, is, uh, was performed by Professor Dubina and other researchers, where they develop a rack uh, model of the rack with the applied element method and perform uh, and recreate and simulate the forklift impact. And they found out that the, uh, the outcomes were be, can be very um, accurate uh, with this method. Uh, Finally, we, I also wanted to check the, uh, the accuracy of the applied element method uh, with the warping effect. So what I did is to take the different uh, sections and different elements and uh, uh, perform the numerical analysis with the applied element method and with, with a software with a seven off formulation. What I found out in this case is that if you uh, discretize well the element, you may have a very good agreement between the seven dot formulation and the applied element method. So therefore it means that the applied element method can be um, a unique tool that can um, replicate accurately all of the, um, all the analysis. So both for the static, seismic and collapse, post-collapse uh, post, uh, scenarios. Now lead to the conclusions. Uh, what we have uh, seen so far is that we have new tools now available for um, the, the analysis of the static and seismic uh, design for the racks, adopting a seven off formulation. We need, however, some uh, additional uh, studies in order to understand how to model uh, the seven off, the warping in some particular details, such as the connections, because we do not know how, if the, the warping is, can be considered with a release or as a, with a continuity between the, the connections. Uh, we have seen also that um, very soon, probably, hopefully, will be an, there will be a new tool for, the, uh, for using the direct displacement-based design for the rocks. And uh, finally, we have seen also that there is a, another new soft new method, which is the applied element method that can be used both for computing the robustness and also computing the warping effects in rocks. In, in addition, uh, there can be more, uh, more studies, uh, hopefully, to understand if the applied element method can also simulate the distortional and local backing, uh, backing failure in rocks because uh, uh, so far you have to check it with new, uh, different and dedicated tools for, uh, for the distortion of local backing. But maybe the applied element method can be useful also in this case. Um, okay, I have finished. I thank you very much for your attention. And, uh, if there are any questions or something, I'm, I'm here. Thank you very much.